All right, turn to chapter two. So last week we left off and we met Hannah and Eli and Elkanah and baby Samuel. She gave birth to a boy and you remember she wanted a son. And she said to the Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you in service. And her way of doing that would by devoting him to become a full-time service at the tabernacle, subjecting him to the Nazarite vow. That was her way of devoting him to the Lord. And she leaves him there to be devoted to God. For this boy I prayed, right, at the end of chapter 1, the Lord has given me my petition, which I ask. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is dedicated to the Lord. So now we, we get to the thought, sort of the thought and the mind behind Hannah during this whole thing as she breaks out into this song and praise. And then the rest of chapter 2, the narrator is sort of painting the background context, it seems, before he moves into sort of the real story. And he goes back and forth as to what's going on with Eli's sons, what's going on with Eli, the, the priest, and then what's going on with Samuel as he continues to grow. So let's read, let's read the entirety of Hannah's prayer, and then we'll kind of break it down a little bit. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then Hannah prayed and said to, in the Lord, Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The, bow, the bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full hire for themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren give birth to seven, but she who had many children languishes. Verse 6, The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he sets the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly one, but the wicked ones are silent in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heaven, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and will exalt the horn of his anointing. So the first two verses is her exalting in God and explaining that the, her horn is exalted in God, and her mouth speak boldly against her enemies, and she rejoices in the salvation of God. And then in verse 2, she gives characteristics of God, which we'll come back to. Verses 3 through 8 is really a compare and contrast on the humble and the proud before God. And you have to wonder if maybe she had in mind, in mind rather, Hananiah, or I'm not, not Hananiah, Penaniah, the other wife of Elkanah, her husband, who had provoked her to the point where she would bitter in her soul. So as she compares and compares the proud and humble, she may see herself as the humble and as her rival Penaniah as the pride. So she compares and she uses stuff like the mighty and the weak, the full and the hungry, the barren and the fertile, dead and alive, sick and well, poor and rich, and humble and exalted. And it's a compare and contrast. And then obviously we know, and the New Testament makes it clear, of course, that God opposes the proud but exalts the humble. Jesus makes that very clear in his teaching too. The, ver, look at verse 2. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Th that phrase, that part of the verse, there is no one holy like you, Lord, or, or it said there is no one holy like the Lord. That has stuck out to me this week as I was reading this, continuing in, throughout the week. Because God is many things, right? He is all-knowing. He knows everything. There's nothing he doesn't know. He's all-powerful. He spoke creation into existence by his word and thing came into being he's everywhere he's love he's wrath 
he's just, he's all of these qualities, but I think the one that really sets all of those and brings them together is his holiness. And the fact that God is holy and he is set apart. He's sacred. He's not like us in that realm. He's not like us in many realms, but especially in his holiness. And I think it forced me to ask and answer the question, do I think about the holiness of God enough? And do we as the church today think about it enough? And there are instances throughout the scripture that helps us to think of God in that holy manner. You remember when God met Moses on the mountain and he gave his charge to Moses to go and free the people of Israel. And he said to Moses, do not come any closer because the ground you're standing on is holy ground. Because the presence of God was there, that's why the ground was now holy. And he said, take your shoes off. In Exodus 34, when Moses walks into the tent of meeting and he meets with God face to face, as it said, as a, as a man would speak to a friend face to face, Moses and God, and he would exit the temple or the, or the tent rather, his face was shining like the sun and the people were scared of Moses. And that was merely an after effect of being in the presence and the holiness of God. In Isaiah 6, I'm going to read it. You don't have to turn if, if you don't want to. Isaiah 6, you know, is the classic text, really, on the holiness of God. And the prophet Isaiah gets a glimpse into the throne room of God, and he describes what he sees. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, this is Isaiah speaking, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim, which is a class of angels, stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And they called out to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's interesting that Isaiah's glimpse into the throne room of God, the very first thing that comes to his mind and his thought was, it's not necessarily how great God is, but how awful he is because of how great God is. Right? He sees the throne room of God and his first reaction is, woe is me because of this. And I think when we have that holiness of God, when we have that vision of the holiness of God, we see ourselves for how we really are, which are people of unclean lips, living among a people group of unclean lips, and we are ruined. John had a similar vision in Revelation 4 when he sees the throne room of God. He says it this way, after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me. And it said, Come up here, and I will show you the thing that must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one was sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like jasper stone and sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sound and pearls of thunder. And there were seven lamps on the fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal in the center, and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature was like a calf, and the third creature had the face of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around them and within. Day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him, because that's what they are. They're creatures. They are created beings. When the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. 
the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne. They will worship him who lived forever and ever, will cast their crown before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and it's because of your will they existed and were created. That is quite that is quite a vision, John has. This vision of the throne room of God and of the four living creatures. Creatures, that's what they are, as great as they appear to be based on their description. And all day and all night they don't stop saying, Holy, 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 and worthy are you. And that is the image of the holiness of God. And Hannah understood that when she says, Indeed, there is no one holy like the Lord. Let me read one more thing. This is from Tozer's book, Knowledge of the Holy. And in his chapter on the holiness of God, this is how he describes it. He says this, we cannot grasp the true meaning of the divine holiness by thinking of someone or something very pure and then raising the concept to the highest degree we are capable of. And he's saying, when you think of the holiness of God, you can't think of the best person you know and then times that times a million. You know, we all know that someone in our mind who's the best person we know and then raise that standard. He said, no, you can't even do that. God's holiness is not simply the best we know infinitely better. We know nothing like the divine holiness. It stands apart, unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, and unattainable. The natural man is blind to it. He may fear God's power and admire his wisdom, but his holiness he cannot even imagine. He goes on to say, holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to that standard. He is the standard of holiness. He is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. Because he is holy, his attributes are that, and whatever we think is belonging to God must be thought of as holy. God is holy with an absolute holiness that knows no degrees, and this he cannot impart to his creatures, but there is a relative and contingent holiness which he shared with his angels and the redeemed men on earth. This holiness God can and does impart to his children. He shares it with them by imputation and by impartation. And because he has made it available to them through the blood of the Lamb, he requires it of them. To Israel first and also to his church, God spoke and said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He did not say, Be ye as holy as I am holy, for that is a demand to be absolute holiness, something that belongs to God alone. So you see what he's saying? He's saying, God imparts to us holiness. How does he do that? Through d justification. Remember, we talked about that. Some of you were with me in Romans. We talked about that doctrine of justification. When God imparts to you his righteousness, his holiness, to the point that we can be holy. That's why the command, be holy as I am holy, makes sense. Otherwise, you cannot be holy by your actions because you are not holy in the sight of God. The verse you just mentioned, be holy, for God is holy, or for I am holy, I think it is uh, how, how, how that's stated. The definition of holy is what? Exalted? But even at that, that, that verse, I, I always have trouble with that because it says, be exalted as God is exalted. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you somewhat answered that as you went on and said we could not be exalted except for uh, uh, that Christ was called, and God was called, and, and his, uh, his influence was on it. But it, uh, that, I was just, I was just an impasse for me that how can I be holy, especially as God is holy? Right. It sounds like a command that doesn't make sense, you know, because we know only God is that perfection of holiness, and He says, "Be holy, for I am holy." But I think when we understand it that way, the only way we can do that is because we understand we are already holy, just, righteous in the sight of God, not based on anything we do, right? But based on what Jesus had done on the cross and how Jesus, God imparts to us the righteousness of Christ so that when he sees and looks down at us, he doesn't see a sinner, he sees Christ. And of course, when he looked at Christ on the cross, he saw us. Right? That's why he was our substitutionary atonement. And then because of that, we can be holy in our actions and steps. Yeah. Yeah. 
I just wanted to take a second on that because, again, I just think it's something we don't think about as often as we should. The holiness of God, what it means that he is holy, what that means for us in our life, and, and I think what that can do for us. Does anyone have thoughts or questions on that before we move on? Jesus teach us how to pray. You know, Jesus right away said that um, our Father, you know, hallowed be your name. Yeah. And and I believe the hallowed is the holiness, is it? Is it yeah. Be. Yep. So he right away did the same thing you're saying. He's right. Recognizing God is holy. Yeah. Yep. That's a good point. We start with that. We start with that in our prayers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Holy be God's name. Yep. And, and let let that comfort you, you know, let the holiness of God comfort you in a world where everybody seems to be running around mad, not knowing what's going on, right? Let, let it comfort you that God is holy, and he was holy 6,000 years ago, and he was holy 3,000 years ago when Hannah said this, he's holy today, and he'll be holy 200 years from now when we're all in heaven, right? So let it, let it be a comfort of us. God's holiness is never dependent on anything else. <laughs> All right, back to 1 Samuel. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside God. I, I love Isaiah 45. What Isaiah 45, nor God says this, I am the Lord. There is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not known me, so that from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, people may know there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly, verse 4, do not let arrogance come out of your mouth. Why? For the Lord is a God of knowledge and with him actions are weighed. So in comparing and contrasting the proud and the humble, Hannah said, don't, don't let arrogance come out of your mouth because God knows things and your actions will be weighed. You remember what Jesus said? He said, every careless word that people speak will give an account for it come the day of judgment. Well, he knows the intent of your heart. Yep, every word, every thought. Just remember that when you talk. When you talk, it's not what you say. It's what's in your heart that he knows. Yeah, right. Because you can say all the right thing, but you can have impure motive. The Pharisees were that way. Absolutely. She, we, we already read it, so we won't read it again. But again, it's a comparing and a contrasting it to the humble and to the, and to the prideful. And then in verse 10, and those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder into heaven. The Lord will judge the end of the earth. I've mentioned before, who's going to be the one that judges the world? It's not God the Father, it's not God the Spirit, but it's Jesus. He, he's going to sit on the throne and judge the world. Paul makes that clear in Acts 17. He says, he has set a day in which he will judge the world by a man, referring to Jesus. Jesus says so in John 5. He said, all judgment had been given to the Son. So the great white throne judgment, when he judges the living and the dead, and he takes into account all the words, all the thoughts, all the deeds, it's going to be Jesus Christ who sits on that throne, judging the world. And he gives strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Verse 11. Then Elkanah went to his home at, went to his home at Ramah, but the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. And that is the last we hear of Hannah. She shows up again, but that's the last we hear of her in terms of her speaking. But what a difference compared to chapter 1. In chapter 1, she was bitter to her soul. Her soul was bitter because she, she did not have a son. She prayed to the Lord, and the Lord gave her a son. And this is a, this wonderful song of rejoicing. One commentator says, Hannah's prayerful song eloquently affirms core concept of Israelite faith. The Lord is a great judge and overseer of human destinies and a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. He is the source of empowerment and victory for those who fear him. But for all others, he is the overpowering authority who dispenses fearful judgment. All right, let's keep moving on. Verse 12. 
Now, again, it's a shift in the scene, and this is what the narrator is doing. He's going back and forth trying to paint pictures as to what's going on. Verse 12. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord and the customs of the priest with the people. When any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and then he would thrust it into the pan or the kettle or the cauldron or the pot, all that the fork had brought up, the priest would take for himself. Thus they did this in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. If the man said to him, Then they must surely burn the fat first, and then take as much as you desire. Then the servant would say, No, but you shall give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sins of the young men were very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. In verse 1, when it said the sons of Eli were worthless men, it translates literally to sons of Belial. And it's really just sons of wickedness. Worthless, vile, sons of ruin. That's what it, that's what it is. And the indication is that they're not believers of God. Though they are the sons of Eli the priest, Eli appears to be a believer, but he is going to be judged um, on account of his son. Though they were the sons of the priest, they did not know God, nor did they want God, and, and really they hated God because of what they were doing. And they demonstrate their wickedness by removing the meat that was being sacrificed, by sending a servant to stick a fork in it while it was boiling, to the point where it wasn't completed, removing it while it was raw. This was wrong because the Torah said that God gets the first portions of the meat and then it's dispensed out. And not only that, but there can be no raw meat. All of it has to be completely cooked. And they're taking it in and removing it before it's cooked, taking a partially raw meat. And when they say no, and when, when someone would object and say, no, it needs to be fully cooked, they say, you give it to me or we'll take it by force. So these, these were the actions the sons of Eli were doing. Thus the sins of the young men were very great, 17, before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. Now again, the scene shifts. Verse 18. Now Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy, wearing a linen ephod. And his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she would come up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Now, we, we talked last week, we said, did Hannah ever see Samuel again? And the answer is, yeah, because every time they would go to Shiloh yearly to sacrifice, she would bring him up a robe. And this was a special robe. It wasn't a robe that she just made on a rainy Sunday afternoon. This was special because it was designed for him to go into the priesthood. Made, uh, verse 20, then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and said, May the Lord give you children from this woman in the place of the one whom she in the place of the one who she dedicated to the Lord. And they went home to their own home. Verse 21. The Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew before the Lord. Does anyone have thoughts or questions or on anything? All right, now the scene shifts back to Eli and back to his son and what they're doing. Verse 22. Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel, how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meetings. The tent of meetings is just another term for the tabernacle. Eli's sons were sleeping with women, probably prostitutes, outside of the tabernacle where God literally lived, right? These were sons of priests who were doing this. Maybe they thought they were allowed to do it or whatever because they were the sons of the priests or whatever, but, I mean, you picture that. Here are all these pious Jewish people coming up to Shiloh year by year to sacrifice, and you have the sons of the priests doing this kind of stuff outside of the tabernacle. He said to them, verse 23, Why do you do such things? The evil thing that I hear from all the people. No, my Lord, 
I know my son, for the report is not good, which I hear from the Lord people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Eventually, the patience of God runs out. A person can live a lifestyle of sin, a sinful lifestyle, day after day, year after year, and God, and if they wake up every single day and get a new day, that's just the grace of God giving them another day to live, right? To live and repent. You, you remember the verse, the mercies of God are new every morning. That's true of us. It's true of everyone, especially the unbeliever, because if he wakes up and sees another day, that's the mercy of God giving him another day to repent. You remember Romans 2? Paul said this, Do you suppose, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of the stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. So the kindness of God leads us to repentance. But eventually, God patient does wear out. And that's the case here. The Lord had desired to put them to death. Verse 26, now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and with men. 27, then a man of God came to Eli and said, thus says the Lord, did I not reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in bondage to the Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose from them all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to carry an effort before me? And did I not give the house of your father from all the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Now the phrase a man of God is just another term for a prophet. It's the second most used term behind a prophet in the Old Testament. And this one is unnamed. We don't know who he is, but he comes to Eli and he speaks for God. Thus said the Lord. And it's interesting. Oftentimes when a prophet would say, thus said the Lord, and then would give a message, they would not always, but very often, first recount all that God had done for them and then give his message. And that's what he does here. Did I not reveal myself to the house of your father while they were in Egypt in bondage to the Pharaoh's house? This is a reference to Aaron your father because Eli could not be a priest unless he was a descendant of Aaron so we're talking about Aaron here and in, in, in the um the priestly office did I not choose them meaning Aaron's tribe from all the tribes of Israel to be my priest to go up to my altar and burn in, incense and carry an infant before me then I now give you the house of your father to all the offerings of the sons of Israel therefore based on what I have done Verse 29, why do you then kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourself fat with the choices of every offering of my people Israel? That was the sin of Eli, by honoring his sons above God. Eli should have stopped what, would do, what his sons were doing, but he didn't. You know, it, we know he said something to them, but in essence, he allowed it to go on because he honored his sons above God. And he said, why have you done this? Why have you honored your sons above me? Verse 30. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. You will see the distress of my dwelling in spite of all the good that I do for Israel, and an old man will not be in your house forever. 
Yet I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar, so that your eyes will fail from weeping and your soul grieve, and all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. This will be the sign to you, which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phineas. On the day, both of them will die, but I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what's in my heart and what's in my soul. I will build him an enduring house and he will walk, with, he will walk before my anointed always. Everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and say, please assign to me one of the priest's offices so that I may eat a piece of bread. So this is a judgment from this man of God, from this prophet coming to Eli. And it's God saying to Eli, your house of being a priest is done. I said to you earlier, I did indeed say your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever, but far be it from me, because if you're going to do this, then I'm going to cut this off. He's not cutting off the priestly office. He's cutting off the house of Eli as serving in the priestly office. Not, and I think it's important, it's not on account for what his sons were doing. We're all responsible for what we do, but it's on account of how he treated that and what he didn't do. So, this judgment is pronounced against Eli. He's very old, but God makes it very clear. Your house, Eli, is done, and I will raise up for myself a new priest. Now, Samuel is in the midst of all of this. He's a young boy. He's very young, and he's training to become the next prophet of Israel. Let's keep reading chapter 3. We would have never done this in Romans. We would have never covered a whole chapter in 25 minutes, so... That's good. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days, and visions were infrequent. Josephus estimates that Samuel at this time is about 12 years old, and he's still in training, and he's still in ministering before God. And that the second half of that verse a uh, word from the Lord was rare in those days and visions were infrequent. It's important to remember when we think about revelation from God, a word from God, how we understand. Yeah, go ahead. I got yeah. a question from the previous chef. Yep. Um, it seems to me that uh, here is an instance uh, or, or an example of something that in the New Testament, we find does not happen. The sins of the father being visited upon uh, future generations. However, here, all of Eli's generations from now until eternity were being punished for what Eli didn't do. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, 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 I don't know, it is, I can't reconcile that. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good observation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Because it, Eli is being judged and punished, but even his future descendants are as well. They'll all die young, I guess. Right. Is, uh, and by the sword. Right. Because of what Eli yeah. did not do in raising his sons. Yeah. And I'm wondering if uh, it's a different situation where it's uh, talking about the, in the New Testament, about uh, <coughs> is this man, I think, was blind because of something his father died, did, you know, and, no, right, so like when Jesus was, yeah, when, yeah. He's, when he said, your sins are forgiven, and then heals well, him. This is a special classification of sin that is so grib that grievous that, mm. that uh, God punishes it in a special way. Right. Of course, you, you know, there's a situation here, Old Testament, you have, it seems to me that under the old law, in the old, in the old Testament, yeah. punishment was dealt with in this life. Yep. Not the future life yep. as we conceive of eternal punishment or eternal life and there's eternal life also was that your days will be long upon this earth so probably i mean the only thing I, way i can reconcile it is that this is a different way of punishing when god was uh had, had a special relationship with his people and it was visited upon the uh descendants because in this life is when punishment comes I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but in our life now, since Christ, 
everything is held till judgment, and at judgment, what and punishment is is meted out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense? Well, it does, and and I think it's it's also Eli's a priest. And a priest was held, in a sense, to a higher standard. And I think the New Testament makes that clear when James said teachers and uh, pastors are, are held to a, not a higher standard in terms of sin, but a more stricter standard because of what they're doing, because of the role that they're doing. And I think the same would be true for a priest in that setting. And, and as teachers under Christ, too, teachers are held to a... Teachers like you are held to I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but you're right. That's what it is. And and it could be that too, where Eli was not just somebody else. He was a high he was a high priest and he was held to that standard. And you know, yeah, it's it's a great point and I think it kinda does show that what we do has effects for the future generation to come. You know. That's true. Of children and grandchildren who we'll never meet, you know, we'll never meet our obviously great 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 grandchildren and all that but what we do has ripple effects you know we can all attest to that we think about our parents and grandparents and things they've done as to how we end up here and how we are russ did you have something yeah i don't have the exact scripture because just because i read well but i remember years ago talking about this and there is i'm not sure exactly where it is whether it's ezekiel or one of the other yeah. i think major prophets but it talks about that transition one of the prophets was where he's talking about the sins of the father and the son and all that and there is a verse in there somewhere that says i will remember the sins of your father no more or something like that mm -hmm. so there is the transition that's coming when jesus comes to earth and mm -hmm. dies for our sins that that no longer happens i just can't remember exactly where it was yeah. after given enough time i could probably find it yes yeah. well and it also reminds me of when god when David wanted to, David wanted David wanted to build a temple and God said no you're a man of war so you can't build the temple and Solomon ended up building the temple and then Solomon is disobedient and you remember God said I want to I'm going to split the kingdom in two but I'm not going to do it under your reign on account of your father David that's what he tells Solomon and she said instead I'm going to do it under your son's name Rehoboam and of course that's when the kingdom is split but it's interesting that he doesn't do it under Solomon's reign on account of his father David who he had a very special relationship with who will study in the second half of this book so that'll be fun if, 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 if some of this stuff is a little kind of boring kind of just drier stuff but once we get to David it'll really ramp up so if, if you're if you're slugging through just Hang on till David. He's coming. What's, what's boring? <laughs> well, you know, everyone's different, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm, if, if it's not great, it's not boring to me, but, so, you know, some of the stuff, when it's foreign stuff, it can be a little dry. -ish. It can kind of slug along. And this is why I didn't do Judges. <laughs> I mean, Judges was just chapter after chapter. It's just names and dates and places. And it was like, oh, man, you know, you're just falling asleep sometimes. Just one last thought on the on the first verse of chapter three, when it says visions and signs were rare in those days. Remember, the Bible was not completed, obviously, during this time period. The, the Torah was, you know, the writings of Moses was, but you couldn't just walk down to the store and pick up a copy. They were probably not available at all. I don't know how, many, how long or how many times it had been translated by then, but it probably was not very available. So the only way they were dependent on a word from God were from prophets, a man of God, a prophet, visions and, and dreams, right? That's was how God would send his word out. And it said there, they were rare in those time periods. But we understand we have the complete revelation of God in the Bible, so we don't rely on those anymore. And I just want to read one thing that Peter says when he's talking about this. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says this, We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitness of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. 
And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. He's talking about, of course, the transfiguration, which he was a witness of. Only him, James, and John, when Jesus takes them up and his face is transformed. And what it says is his robe was as white as light and his face shone like the sun. My, my second Lord of the Rings reference, okay? You remember in the second movie when, you know, Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas come across the white wizard and his face is, and they think it's the other guy, and his face is shining and it's so bright. That's kind of what it was like, but a lot better, okay? That's my second reference. Maybe you'll get another one next week. But he's talking, he's making reference to that, the transfiguration, when he said, this is what we saw, but look what he said next in verse 19. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. What's he saying? He's saying, look, as great as seeing the transfiguration was, as great as I had the opportunity to see that, you have something better. What, it, what is it? The prophetic word made more sure. And it's a reference to the scriptures. And he's saying that is better than me seeing the transfiguration of Christ because you have the entire thing. Now, of course, when Peter was writing this, this was not completed at the Bible, but some of the New Testament books were, the entire Old Testament was, and Peter's point is, the scriptures trump everything else, you know, because in the prior days, God would speak through those ways, but now, of course, we have the Bible, we have the scriptures, so when we want to hear the word of God, we read the scriptures, and we want to hear it out loud, we read the scriptures out loud, that's how we hear the word of God, that's how we hear the voice of God. He says that again, Paul, well, Paul says in the Timothy letters that all scripture is inspired by God. And in Jesus, when he said in, in the Sermon on the Mount that what he said, even the tiniest letter will not pass away. And it's a reference to the tiniest stroke in the Hebrew alphabet. So that is the context. We'll stop here. That is the context as to the call of Samuel the boy as a prophet. The house of Eli had been judged. Visions and words from God were rare in those days, and now God is going to call this young boy Eli to become the next prophet of Israel and lead the people of Israel. All right, does anyone have final thoughts or questions?